Brothers and sisters, I invite you to kneel with me in prayer. Those even viewing the video, let's kneel together humbly before God. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. We come before you with a deep need. And Father, we confess that we are incomplete without you. We need your wisdom. We need your guidance. We need conviction. We need direction. We need hope. Father, you know what we need. And so I pray that whatever it is that each individual soul needs from you, that you would speak that clearly. Remove me from the equation, I pray, and may your Holy Spirit make your will done in each and every life. In Jesus' name, amen. I have been looking forward to this for a long time. It was a couple years ago when I started to get deeply into the study of media and entertainment, the effects of video gaming, the effects of television, advertising, the movies, Hollywood, and internet pornography. I thought to myself, that's one topic among the litany of media and entertainment topics. That's one topic that needs a complete seminar just for itself. The topic of lust and overcoming internet pornography. I'll tell you something, I was going to share just maybe two messages on this topic. And as I delved deeply into exploring God's plan and design for sexuality, understanding the devil's agenda to trip us up, I'm convinced that this area is the area where men have the greatest stumbling block in their lives, bar none. And so here we are to do a six part seminar on this extremely important topic. And I'll tell you, if you care about souls, if you care about lives and eternal salvation, you care about this issue because it is people's souls are on the line. So we're going to spend some time. We're going to spend some time delving into it. And I want to begin with the most important area of the body, the same area we began with in the Media on the Brain seminar, and that is the brain. The brain is only 2% of the body's weight, but it uses 20% of the body's energy. And not just that, but the neurons in your brain propel messages through brain circuits at 250 miles per hour. So as you can see, the brain is extraordinarily powerful. But not only is it powerful, it is also complex. Take a look at this. The brain is actually more complex than our entire solar system. Brain, the brain contains about a hundred billion neurons, a hundred billion. That's a hard number for me to even conceive of. The number of nerve cells, brain cells in my brain exceeds a hundred billion. But not just that. Each neuron can make thousands of separate connections with other neurons. So let's do a little bit of math here. What they're telling us, the best estimates that they have come up with is that there are possibility of 40 quadrillion separate connections within one human brain. That's 40 quadrillion. I was trying to wrap my mind around how big of a number that truly is. It's astronomical in proportions. It's bigger than I can even conceive of. So I, I did a little digging on that. And think about 40, let's take it in terms of dollars. Let's think of 40 quadrillion dollars. If you took dollar bills and placed them one at a time on the surface of the earth, one dollar here next to it, immediately next to it, and immediately next to it, another dollar, even across land and sea, 40 quadrillion dollars would span the entire surface of the earth 50 times nearly 50 times. 40 quadrillion possible connections in one human brain. This is way more than you can even possibly use in one lifetime. If you think about how you can explain that from an evolutionary standpoint, why would our brains evolve to be so much more complex than you can even use in a lifetime? You know why? It's because we were created for eternal life, to grow perpetually in our ability to understand and comprehend God we are fearfully and wonderfully made, are we not? In fact, it gets even more interesting. The 40 quadrillion figure, as big and incomprehensible as that is, pales in comparison to the number of different possible electrochemical configurations of the connections that we can have in the brain. Basically, there, you can have thousands of different electrochemical configurations for each neuron and each connection that that neuron makes with another one. 
so the, the numbers when we look at the different possible electronic figure, uh, configurations in the brain, it actually exceeds one with 10 trillion zeros behind it. So we're looking at a number, I don't, I don't even want to try and understand that. And that's what we know of. That's what we are aware of at this point in our understanding of science. Amazing, amazing. Now I have a book right here. It's one of my favorite books. It's called Mind, Character, and Personality. This was a book that was actually compiled based upon 19th century statements and quotations and commentaries on the brain, on the mind, on, on the personality, mind, character, and personality. And in this book, you will find statements that were way ahead of their time. In fact, modern science is one by one confirming everything that I read in this book. So you're going to hear quite a few quotations over the next six sessions from that book. It's one of my favorites, and I think you'll really gain a lot from it. I'll tell you something, though, right out of the gate. Christian scientific writers just don't write today like they did back then. And that's why I look to a 19th century source because nobody can write like that book presents the reality. And here's one statement that you'll hear. The brain nerves which communicate with the entire system are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his inmost life. So not only is the brain extremely powerful and extremely complex, but this is the spiritual battleground between Christ and Satan. This is the organ where our spiritual nature is housed. And you know what? That brings us to the issue of sexual addiction because a powerful organ can become powerfully addicted. Hey folks, if you're enjoying the program, open up another tab and head over to beltoftruth.tv. You'll see all of our other seminars and topics there from parenting seminars, breaking free from the social control of the power elite through the worldly media and schooling agendas, American history, the history of the pilgrims, history of abortion, overcoming media addictions, bunch of practical topics. And those who believe in our message and want to support the work we are doing, please consider subscribing there. It's free for the asking for those who can't afford the $7 a month, but subscribe at beltoftruth.tv for all of our content. And I'll tell you right now, we are going to look at during this session how lust and pornography and these issues affect the brain. When you see the depth of the problem that we have gotten into, it is going to call forth the most urgent plea for help, for recovery, for steps that we're going to take that are radical because we see how big of a hole we've gotten ourselves into. And I'll tell you, the good news will be when you see the problem right within the problem, you'll identify the solution. You won't even need me to tell you about it. It's amazing. Let's get into it. Only 13.9% of young adult males never view pornography. Now, if that's not a sobering statistic, I'm not sure what is. That's 86.1% of them then are viewing pornography on a regular basis. Now, if you're one of the 13.9% that never views pornography, don't think, well, good, I don't have to learn anything about my brain when it comes to lust. I don't need to battle this. I'll tell you, if you're a male watching this, you need to Explore this topic deeply and seek God's will on this topic deeply because even if you're one of the 13.9% who don't view pornography, there's still lust and behaviors that we need to deal with. So this seminar, seminar is for all men. All men, it doesn't matter how old, it doesn't matter how deeply you are into sexual addiction. And by the way, women also should view this material so you can understand men's brains a little bit more. And not just that, ladies struggle with a lot of the, the same kinds of things. And so you'll pick up some very helpful things. So there was a study that was done. So one Canadian researcher attempted to launch a study on university age men and their pornography use. And what he found was the study could not go forward. They, were, they could not find any college age males who weren't already using pornography. I think he only overstated it slightly when he said, guys who do not watch pornography do not exist. Now isn't that quite a statement coming from a secular researcher he's saying look we couldn't find anybody that wasn't viewing this stuff probably a slight overstatement because I'll tell you there is a statistic that hasn't been compiled yet and that I haven't shared with you 
And it's a very hopeful statistic. I can't wait till I see it. Hopefully some researcher compiles this. I am convinced that right now, more men are recovering from sexual addictions than at, than at any time in history. Because people are waking up. They're saying, I've had enough of this. I want a real solution. Now, as Christians, we need a real solution, too, because this pornography industry is booming all around us. From 2001 to 2007, the Internet pornography industry grew from $1 billion per year to $3 billion per year in the U.S. alone. And those are some old numbers, so it's ballooned even further since then. 50% of Christian men admit in surveys to being addicted to pornography. Not just that, but 54% of Christian pastors have actually viewed pornography in the previous year. So we are dealing with a very serious, deep issue within the church. And if you're inspired and motivated and you're saying right now, I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to tell my wife everything I've ever done. I'll tell you something. Proceed with caution. You do not want to divulge every piece of private information and unload that all on your wife all at once. Not wise. You're going to want to take some necessary steps in recovery and in healing. You're going to actually, one, one, one research data point has, has identified that over 70%, over 70% of women are actually dealing with, with trauma. They're severely traumatized. With, with functional impairments in their lives because uh, coming a, becoming aware of what has been going on that they weren't aware of. So before saying anything, view this seminar. We're going to get into the topic of proper disclosure a little bit later in the seminar. And parts four, five, and six will be the healing process. So do make sure to stick around for the entirety of the seminar. So we're asking ourselves, why is it so hard to stop? You've probably tried to stop lusting after women, viewing the things that you may be viewing, engaging in the behaviors you're engaging in. You've tried really hard. You don't believe in doing these things. You don't want to be doing these things. Well, the reason that it's so hard to stop is you actually have experienced a structural change within the brain. And it, through repeated pornography, repeated even just lust, repeated masturbation, these things will change the brain structure in a very serious way. Or as it says in Mind, Character, and Personality, moral principles, moral principle is exceedingly weak when it conflicts with established what? Established habit. So we're dealing with habits right now that even if we have the moral principles, we have the correct beliefs, we don't want to be doing these things, but the habits are so established that moral principle is weak. What you're looking at on the screen right now is a normal human brain. This is a SPECT scan, a single photon emission computerized tomography scan. There's a mouthful for you. It's a very interesting technology that shows brain activity. A healthy normal brain looks like this under a SPECT scan. Now brace yourself. This is a pornography user's brain. Do you see the difference? You see damaged areas of the brain, much less activity in certain areas of the brain, but it gets even more serious than that. What I'm going to show you next, the first time I saw this, my jaw hit the floor and I said, now I realize what we've gotten ourselves into in the 21st century. What you see on the screen now is a cocaine addict's brain. Take a look at that compared with a pornography addict's brain. Which one looks worse? Which one looks like it has more holes and areas of non-functionality? Pornography addiction is a very real addiction. And we're talking about something that's as bad as or worse than drug use to the brain. Now I understand a little bit what, what the Apostle Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians. When he spoke to the Corinthians in chapter 6, he said something very serious in verse 18. He said that the person who sins sexually, who commits sexual immorality, is sinning against his own body. Now that's not just the physiology of the body and the organs of the body that he's talking about. We are sinning against our brain. The Apostle Paul says something incredible. He says that actually if we are, if we are destroying and defiling the temple of God, chapter 3 verse 17, we will actually be destroyed. You can now look on a brain scan 
at what that looks like in practice. The brain is literally being destroyed by this stuff. And so we use the word addiction. We use this word deliberately and intentionally, not just any addiction, but sexual lust and acting out is a poly drug. It's an emotional excitement, a sensory thrill, and it is sexually energizing. It is a mood altering experience. It is a a habit of compulsion. And in, in so doing, it is a addiction of the highest order. The psychiatry community uses a seven question survey to diagnose whether you're addicted to some substance. You can actually use these same questions when it comes to a behavioral addiction. So consider now, are you addicted to some sort of sexual behavior or the lust of the eyes? Let's look at the seven. First of all, for an addict, tolerance is formed. What that means is there is an increased intensity that is desired and needed in order to get the same effect. Or it's just a reduced effect with the same amount of intensity. Secondly, withdrawal symptoms are observed. Third, there is progressive consumption, meaning more consuming of the substance or the behavior over time. Fourth, there is a desire to quit, but the efforts to cut down are unsuccessful. Fifth, you spend more time on it over time. Sixth, other important activities in life have lost importance and less time is spent on them. And seventh, you continue to engage in the behavior even in the face of physical consequences or psychological problems that you're aware of. And now the psychiatrists tell us that if you can answer yes to three of those, you have what would be identified as a diagnosable addiction. And so I know that that's the majority of men in the church and in in our country and in the world today are really, really captive to the sexual lusts of the flesh and lusts of the eyes. They did a study recently, just last year, at Cambridge University, 2013 study. What they found was amazing. When the brain activity of compulsive pornography users was compared to a control group, what's called the ventral striatum, this is a reward center of the brain, reacted to seeing sexually explicit content in the exact same way as an alcoholic's brain reacts to seeing advertisements for alcohol. And you can see on the screen right there, the healthy brain has a normal functionality, but then the heightened activity within the limbic system, within the pleasure centers of the brain, you can see the compulsive pornography user experiences that when just viewing an image because it's just like an addiction, just like an alcoholic as we just read. Now, what you read from this individual, Dr. Jeffrey Satinover, he was testifying before the U.S. Senate and he said the following. Modern science allows us to understand that the underlying nature of an addiction to pornography is chemically nearly identical to a heroin addiction. Add to his comment, the comment by Dr. Judith Reisman, and she said the following. Pornography triggers a myriad of endogenous internal natural drugs that mimic the high from a street drug. Addiction to pornography is addiction to what I dub erototoxins, mind-altering drugs produced by the viewer's own brain. So it is a drug, but many of us will say things, you know, I don't really struggle with it as much as a lot of guys out there. You know, maybe I I viewed it like last year, Uh, but you know, it's not a real problem for me. Do we say that about heroin use? Do we say that about cocaine use? Pornography is not healthy in any dose. It's not something that, well, I only see it occasionally, use it occasionally, so it's not a big problem for me. Even if you're not clinically addicted, you you don't have to take cocaine in small doses to have a problem with it. And and in fact, if you give the devil that little toehold in your life, you know what he's going to do? He's going to dig in deeper and deeper into your soul and you let the lust of the eyes just get a a little bit of, of a hold on your soul. You're giving the devil a foothold in your life and it's going to begin to take over. So we use the word addiction, but not just that. Numerous studies have shown that pornography literally overwhelms the brain's ability to make wise decisions. The scientists are using words like it's hypnotic. It's it's overwhelmingly captivating. There's one Christian author that I read from the 19th century. I love the term when describing licentiousness or lust. The term witchcraft is actually used. It's bewitching. It's a species of witchcraft from a Christian point of view because we know that the 
devil is the true one behind this. The science is interesting at a secular level, but we know this is a spiritual attack. You, complete, you become completely captive to these images. They assault you. They, they, there's nothing like this in Satan's arsenal to take over your mind and your brain. In fact, you get to the point where when you're looking at something, the thought of escaping it is actually unpleasant. You, you want it to suck you in is the feeling of a pornography user and deeper and deeper you go. Now, by the way, this is not the first time in human history that we have struggled with something like this. There was a time a long time ago where wickedness on the earth had become so great that God had to bring a flood. And Jesus referred to that. Listen to his statement. He says, for as in the days of before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. He goes on to say, just as in the days of Noah, it will be the same. Eating, drinking, and marrying. Now, by the way, I said this was such a wicked world before the flood, and we live in quite a wicked time now, but what's wrong with these things? Are these things bad in and of themselves? We say, you know, eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, and then God sent the flood. Well, are these things bad in and of themselves? No, of course not. But why did Jesus name these three then? Think about this. What do these three have in common? Eating, drinking, marrying, and sexuality, that, that issue in, all in one package. Eating, drinking, marriage, and sex. What do these three have in common? Well, if you think about it, they are all based upon the drive for survival and perpetuation of life. Eating, drinking, and then procreation. So these are areas deep within our nature where we are going to be self-preservation focused. Eating, drinking, marrying. There's a statement that's absolutely fascinating that I want you to listen to. This is from a devotional book called Maranatha, and it says the controlling power of what? It says appetite, right? Eating, drinking, sexuality will prove the ruin of thousands when if they had conquered on this point, they would have had the moral power to gain the victory over how many other temptations? Every other temptation of Satan. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting per Christian character. The continual transgression of man for 6,000 years has brought sickness, pain, and death as its fruits. And as we near the close of time, Satan's temptation to indulge appetite will be more powerful and more difficult to overcome. So you, you heard it. If you can conquer on this point, you can conquer on any temptation that the Satan will bring your way. What is it about eating, drinking, sexuality that are so captivating, so difficult to overcome? Well, if you think about that survival mechanism, who is it that's at the center of that? I want this. I want that. It gives me pleasure. I will perpetuate life for myself. And it's selfishness at the root of that, isn't it? There is a group of people in the very last days, it talks about them in Revelation 12. They are the overcomers in the last days. And it says those who followed the Lamb, wherever he goes, had one very distinctive characteristic about them. Have you read this in verse 11 of chapter 12 of Revelation? It says that they followed the Lamb wherever he goes and that they did not love their own lives unto the death. They did not love their own life even unto death. Revelation 12 verse 11. Now think about that for a second. They were willing to sacrifice even life. This is why if we can sacrifice our own pleasures, which deeply within our brains represent survival, we can overcome anything that Satan will throw at us. And that's the good news. Now I want to tell you something else. If you look at your, at your brain, you look deeply into this neurological process of how pornography or, or lust in general can take over, what you're going to see is we're going to take it step by step. Exactly what happens from the moment that image first shows up to the moment where you've made all the compromises that you never thought you'd make. And you're going to see the points where you can have some, some control over it and you're going to also see the results of it. But first of all, the first area of the brain I want to show you is called the hippocampus. This area is hardwired. It's not very plastic. The word plastic in neurological circles simply means changeable, malleable. It, 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 it can be altered. The hippocampus is not very plastic. It's where your survival drives are rooted deeply within the brain. So you have a desire for food, drink, 
and sex. These things are things that God gave us. So those desires are not bad. Having that as a part of your nature is not bad. You shouldn't want that to go away because that would make you less human. God has given us that as, as, as image bearers of him. He, he wants us to have that in our brain. But let's follow the lust cascade beyond just the, the, the internal drive systems that we've mentioned here with the hippocampus. Let's start with step one in the process. You are assaulted with an image somewhere, a billboard, a magazine, a screen, this computer screen, the phone. The first step that that image takes on its journey is called the thalamus. Within the thalamus is, is something called the LGN. This area also is hard wired. It's not very plastic and it automatically sends the image to the occipital lobe. That's the back of the head which processes vision. So here at this point you've seen that alluring image. Did you sin? For noticing an, attra an attractive image was that sin? The very first step the LGN, all it did was, it's hardwired, you can't change that, it sent it to the occipital lobe and you saw it, okay? There, there, the will has not been engaged yet at this point in the journey, okay? When, when, when the body sees something that looks tasty, water if you're thirsty or whatever, that initial boom moment, don't, don't fret about that. Don't want that to go away as I said, but here's where things start to change. When you choose to fix your eyes on that image, for more than the very, very millisecond, what happens is step two. Step two is where the occipital lobe is processing the image. Or if you're imagining something, you don't have to only be seeing it. You're, you're, you're seeing it in your mind's eye or you're seeing it and you get to choose. Do you hold that image? Do you allow the occipital lobe to continue to process that? Because if you do, something's going to happen and we'll see that in just a second. But it probably comes as no surprise that within the occipital lobe of the brain, there is more activity in men than in women when it comes to viewing sexually alluring images. I found that fascinating because men are designed more visually and this is why pornography captures men so much more. The next step in the journey is the body begins to release testosterone. Every time you take in a sexual cue throughout the day and, and the more you behold it, the more you contemplate it, the more you image that, it's priming the body for sexual action. It's, it's released into the blood bloodstream. And I should tell you that each sexual thought, each, each fantasy that you engage in builds up more testosterone. And so by the, you know, it's, it's slow to dissipate. It's like this wave of testosterone within your bloodstream that you've chosen by continuing to view and behold and, and imagine. Interestingly, by the way, speaking of testosterone, they've found that men in committed relationships Men in committed relationships who are not interested in, in, in other, other sexual partners, they are focused on their wife. These men have lower testosterone levels. So you see the connection there between lower testosterone levels and the, the less likelihood to commit adultery. But you'll notice this all begins with the eyes. Now if you're now on this step of the journey, you're beholding, you, you've, you've, you've looked at it for more than a, a millisecond, you're on what's called the lust cascade. Now the reason this is important with the prefrontal cortex is the prefrontal cortex is the brakes. When, when your brain is saying, I'm activating the will, I don't want to go down that pathway, that's the prefrontal cortex being engaged. But since you've gone down this lust cascade, the physiological process is engaged, 100 beats per minute with the heart rate, the prefrontal cortex is, is out for the count. And this is why it's so hard to stop. This is why it's so hard to stop the lust cascade because the primitive centers, the more deep emotional centers and the, the, the the desirous centers for survival are in the driver's seat and they are taking you down that highway. Now this is where step four comes in and this is a hugely important step because after you've beheld that image, after you've engaged in that thought or that imagination for more than that initial millisecond, the drive tension of the hypothalamus increases causing amygdala agitation. The amygdala is a very, very important part of this process because the amygdala, that is the fear center of the brain, the anxiety and tension center of the brain. It's the area of the brain that, that, that gets you on edge and demands that you do something. And you know what that something is here is it's demanding sexual activity. So, so there's this, this, this hypertension going on within the amygdala and then typically what men will do is, is respond because we've already gotten this far into the, into the journey, into the highway, if you will. And so step five, usually men will respond through seeking more pleasure, 
pleasurable images and then masturbation. This releases enormous quantities of dopamine in endogenous opiates. The pleasure reward centers of the nucleus accumbens and the cingulate cortex are stimulated just the same as with substance abuse. And then upon ejaculation, the amygdala are immediately calmed anxiety and tension is released. So the amygdala clamored for it and the amygdala got what it wanted. And that's, that's the basic story every time that men go down this path. The question is how to stop the lust cascade from happening. First thing, don't look for more than that millisecond. Do not look a second time. Now that's easy enough, right? We, we, many of us have tried hard, right? Many men have tried really hard to overcome this thing. Here's one of the problems. And, and do stick around for sessions four, five, and six because you'll see all the solutions there. But, but I want to leave you with some hope in this session as well. But one of the problems with I'm going to try not to think about it is that doesn't work. I, I want to do a little exercise right now. Try not to think about an elephant right now. Now, of course, everybody just thought about an elephant because when you're trying not to think about something, you're thinking about it, right? So we need to immediately not just turn our eyes away, not just avoid looking at it for that millisecond, but also immediately fill the mind with something else and stick around for the other sessions. We'll get deeply into that and we're going to see how to truly overcome this stuff. Now, here's one more thing, too. You need to be able to calm down. Because when that initial arousal occurs, the hypothalamus is engaged, the drive center right there, and you weren't able to have any control over that, that, that initial feeling, that initial attraction. So you want to be able to calm that down and not go down the lust cascade. And th this is where we bring in some, some oxygen into the system. A deep breath, what they've actually found, actually calms the dorsal vagal nerve, which is a part of the lim limbic system, connected to the limbic system right here in the back of, of, of the head and down into the neck. The dorsal vagal nerve will be calmed through a deep breath. Okay, And I'm not talking about new age meditation here. I'm just talking about proper breathing. You read in a book called Ministry of Healing that a good respiration soothes the nerves. Okay, So breathe from the belly and take one deep, big deep breath. And immediately you're filling your mind with other things that we're going to talk about in the other sessions. But that oxygen will not only calm the dorsal vagal nerve, which is a limbic system, drive center, pleasure-seeking area of the brain, but it fills the brain with good oxygen, the blood with good oxygen. And the prefrontal cortex will work better because it's still engaged at that point and you can use it to say no to that thought and that image. And when you're, when you're going through your day, it's good to be breathing properly all the time. We forget because we get stressed, we have a fast-paced life, and we just generally, as a people, breathe very shallowly from up here. So it's good to have every now and then to, to just take a break. And my wife and I have done something in our home where we will set our phone every, every hour. She gets the top of the hour and I get the bottom of the hour. And we go every hour, each of us, and spend some time in prayer. And during that time where we are talking to God, engaging the thoughts, I'm not talking about Eastern meditation here, but you, you make sure to breathe properly and just rest in God's presence and his grace. And, and that will actually help physiologically as well. Now, once you've gone down those steps of the lust cascade, already culminated in step five, there are still a few more steps and then some more effects to take place. First of all, step six is that norepinephrine burns that initial arouser right into the memory to call it up at a later time. So the things that you've done in the past will be more likely repeated in the future because this is a very significant event that the brain has just experienced. The brain has just had this enormous pleasure experience and the, the salience network of the brain, salience meaning it, it, it's determining the significance of things and determining what kinds of things to remember and what not. Oh, the brain's saying, remember that. That was hugely pleasurable. We need to call that up again at a later time. This was physiologically and emotionally and, and a, a a, a ten, intense pleasure. And so the brain wants to do it again. Now, step seven is also a, a, a hormonal thing that's happening. Oxytocin 
and vasopressin are involved with step seven. These are the trust, love, bonding hormones, if you will. It, to, to learn a little bit about oxytocin and vasopressin, just look at what happens within a woman's body. When a woman is breastfeeding, a lot of oxytocin is released, the bonding agent with that nurturing love with the baby. And, and also, women have an enormous amount of oxytocin that's released when they give birth to a child, which if you think about it, it's kind of insane that they would go through that again because it's an extremely painful experience. But the oxytocin makes that a, a significant event, and so, so they'll do it again. But not just that, it's also oxytocin and vasopressin that are released when orgasm takes place. This is in men and in women. And so think about this. Women who are in an abusive relationship, many times they, they, they won't leave. And, and there are other emotional issues going on as well there. But one of the reasons that women won't leave a, an abusive relationship is because there's that bond. The, the oxytocin and vasopressin have bonded her to this man. And, and also, if you're a single person, if you're a young person right now, this is the same reason why sexual activity of any kind is, is, is very unwise before marriage. I'm not even talking about morality, of course, even more so when it comes to what God's laws are and what God has asked us to do, but it's just unwise because you're going to bond yourself to this person and you're going to lose objectivity about them. You're not going to be evaluating them honestly and accurately and fairly. You will have these just, just deep emotional connections with them. And then if you do break up, which most relationships do break up that aren't marriages, it's going to be so painful. And, and then you're going to bounce into another relationship. And that's going to not be a healthy one either. And this, we get into some big, big trouble for this very reason. But what does this have to do with lust and pornography? Well, the same thing is happening in the male brain when he has this experience with the woman on the screen. We were designed to have that release of vasopressin and oxytocin so that we would bond with our wives, right? So that we would return to her continually and, and have that deep, intimate relationship. Well, now we have that with this woman that we saw on the screen or the magazine or whatever, or the video, and, and many women for that matter. So we've got all these counterfeit bonds with women all over the place. We are wedded to them. This is why Jesus said it's adultery when you lust after a woman in your heart. Now, what are the effects of the lust cascade? First effect, if you go all the way down this road that we've just looked at, it's going, it, you saw that the, the fear centers of the brain were activated. The amygdala was activated. The fear and anxiety. Well, what happens with fear and anxiety is it actually impairs conscience and altruism. The amygdala, which you can see on the bottom right of the screen, and the anterior cingulate cortex, which you can see on the bottom left of the screen, these two are like a teeter-totter. They run opposite to one another. So if you think about the teeter-totter, when one side is up, the other side is down, right? When the other side is up, the other side is down, like this. It's the same thing. If you're experiencing fear and anxiety, insecurity, tension, who's the focus of that? It's self, right? So you're not able to be other-centered with the altruism. But the opposite is true. When you have altruistic thoughts about the benefit of other people and, and how to do good things for others, well, you're, you're not thinking about yourself anymore, are you? This is why it says in the book of 1 John, perfect love casts out all fear. 1 John 4, 18, perfect love casts out all fear. And by the way, the opposite is the truth also. A lot of fear will cast out love from our hearts. And that's how we end up with this problem. And, and, and what you read actually here on the screen is that having their own consciences seared with a hot iron is what we're doing because the, the anterior cingulate cortex of the brain, these are the conscience circuits in the brain. And if we are just continually activating our amygdala, living in a life of, 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 of fear, hiding what we're doing, we're wondering if people are going to know, fear of condemnation of God, we, we have chronic amygdala function. The anterior cingulate cortex of the frontal lobe is not going to be very healthy. And so we are searing the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex, the conscience. We're searing the conscience in a very real way. That's why the Bible talks about this. Another effect of the lust cascade is that the higher cortex is less left out of the equation again and again every time you go down that road prefrontal cortex is is decoupled right and so the result is when you're not exercising the frontal lobe you're having increased impulsivity 
loss of self-control and self-centeredness. So in other words, the character is damaged further and further. And not just that, but that natural route to pleasure that God gave us via the prefrontal cortex is decoupled from the process. So if you think about the different ways that we can acquire and attain pleasures God's way, I get into this in in great depth in, in disc six of the Media on the Brain seminar, but just think about using that prefrontal cortex in a way where you're engaging in some thought or problem solving or, or, or in coming up with a new discovery or maybe you're exercising your will to go for a jog. and You get that runner's high, right? There, there are positive pleasures that we gain when we use the brain the way that God designed it to be used. Well, we're not using it that way anymore, so our brain gets addicted to the quick fix pleasure. There's a lot more on that in Media on the Brain. I'll just, I'll just stop there because I've already said much about that. But that's another one of the effects. Here is an actual scan of the brain that illustrates that. You see on the left the healthy control brain. And you can see the nice lit up dark areas there, those, those pleasure areas of the brain. This person, when they view a beautiful sunset or they see a child smile and laugh, you know, they have pleasures in life. The drug abuser has a very muted or numbed pleasure response. And it's the same thing with a pornography user as we've seen. Another effect of the lust cascade is that the sexual experience releases these endorphins, these enkephalins, and these opiates four times stronger than morphine. And so, due to the intense pleasure reward experience at the end of the lust cascade, this whole process is going to be repeated. See the image. Survival drive is set into motion. Dwelling upon the image, heightened amygdala tension, release of amygdala tension, which is combined with a dopamine rush and a reward circuit firing off. That becomes a pattern that the brain demands happen again and again. And this is where we get into the pathways of the brain setting their course. And this is what we do. And this is our habit. And this is our addiction. I'm going to share with you a quotation from an excellent book by William Struthers called Wired for Intimacy. He says the following, as men fall deeper into the mental habit of fixating on these images, the exposure to them creates neural pathways. Like a path is created in the woods which eat with each successive hiker, so do the neural paths set the course for the next time an erotic image is viewed. So you see the pathway grows wider each time you go through it. Over time, continuing reading, these neural paths become wider as they are repeatedly traveled with each successive exposure to pornography. They become the automatic pathway through which interactions with women are routed. Pornography deepens a grand canyon-like gorge in the brain through which images of women are destined to flow. Repeated exposure to pornography creates a one-way neurological superhighway where a man's mental life is over-sexualized and narrowed. It is hemmed in on either side by high containment walls, making escape nearly impossible. This neurological superhighway has many on-ramps. The mental life is fixated on sex. It is wide, able to accommodate multiple partners, images, and sexual possibilities. But it is intended to be narrow, a place for God's exclusive love to be imaged. The neurological superhighway has only a few off-ramps. So these habits become ingrained. When you walk that pathway over and over again, it eventually becomes this widened thing that is the path you go down every time without thinking about it. It's kind of like if, if you learn to drive a stick shift. It eventually becomes second nature to drive a stick shift, right? You don't have to think about it or to brush your teeth. You don't have to really think about it. God gave us the ability to form habits so that life can be more efficient and so that we can have holy, healthy habits as well. But have you ever tried driving stick shift in a foreign country? You go to, and they drive on the other side of the road and you're, 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 you're having to think about it so much and you're going, okay, which direct? Okay, it, it's really hard for the brain. Well, it's the same thing with any habit of thought or action, motor skills or anything. When your brain will remember routines, it will, it will automate everything so that it, there's more space freed up in the brain to do other thinking so you can be more efficient. And so what we read here in the book Maranatha is, is basically you get yourself in a situation where, where the following applies. Even some who profess to be looking for the appearing, for Christ's appearing, are no more prepared for that event than Satan himself. They are not cleansing themselves from all pollution. They have so long served their lust that it is natural for their hearts to be impure and their imaginations corrupt. 
It is as impossible to cause their minds to dwell upon pure and holy things as it would be to turn the course of Niagara Falls and send its waters pouring up the falls. Now that sounds like something impossible. She used the word impossible there, the author, and so I'm going, well, if it's impossible, then I'm going to throw my hands up. With God, all things are possible. So it may feel impossible. It may in my own flesh be impossible in a very real way. But it, what, what I'm doing, the further I get myself into it, it's going to become harder and harder. Because you, can you think about what happens with the holiness pathways up in the frontal cortex? The, the pathways of true righteousness and self-control and the will. What's happening with those pathways while I'm engaged in going down this super highway? Well, what we read in Mind, Character, and Personality is the sensitive nerves of the brain have lost their healthy tone by morbid excitation to gratify an unnatural desire for sensual indulgence. What you see on the screen is some, some neuron fibers called axons and dendrites. These are the little fibers at the ends of a cell that enable all the tens of thousands of connections that we were talking about earlier. And these axons and dendrites actually change shape and form and direction based upon our choices and our habits in life, our, our diet, our environment, everything. Thoughts, even, will change axons and dendrites. The axon is the sending signal, and the dendrite is the receiving fiber, rather. The sending fiber and the receiving fiber to make the neurons be able to connect so that we can have thoughts in, in our brains. Now, w w what's especially interesting and helpful to me about this is that the only way that I can form new pathways. The only way that I can have these axons and dendrites sending the signal in a way where I can have a new thought, where I don't need to go down that superhighway, is to change thoughts, change choices. And this is where we can be empowered by God to deal with this. Addiction, I don't want to think about addiction in terms of the, the substance you're using or the behavior in, you're engaging in. Addiction is about changing the brain structure. Addiction is about the structural change in the brain that has taken place. And so the key to freedom is going to be a new structural change, new pathways to replace the old. As Dr. Struthers puts it, listen to this quotation. If this corrupted pathway can be avoided, a new pathway can be formed. We can establish a healthy sexual pattern where the flow is redirected toward holiness rather than corrupted intimacy. So you don't go down the highway, it's redirected. By intentionally redirecting the neurochemical flow, the path toward right thinking becomes the preferred path and is established as the mental habit. By deepening the holiness pathways, we are freed from deciding to do what is right and good as they become part of our embodied nature. So the goal is as we don't get on that highway, don't get on that highway, we form a new pathway, this becomes the new habit. Literally, the old brain, the old pathways, the old brain map, if you will, of roads is being replaced by a brand new one. This is what Paul is talking about in Romans 12, verse 2, when he says, we can have a renewed mind. And that's a promise. And I'm going to claim that for myself and for all my brethren, that God is going to give us that. If the brain is powerful enough to get you addicted to a behavior, then it's just as powerful to get you addicted to a new behavior. Listen to this one from A User's Guide to the Brain. I love the title of the book. Jay Rady, listen to this statement. Changing the brain's firing patterns through repeat, repeated thought and action is also what is responsible for the initiation of self-choice, freedom, will, and discipline. This is a secular statement here. He says, we have the ability to remodel our brains. Now, I would look at that from a spiritual perspective and say it's God that's doing the remodeling. But didn't you hear him say that through the will and freedom and choice, you can have a new brain? In mind, character, and personality, we read the following statement. If Christ be the theme of contemplation, the thoughts will be widely separated from every subject which will lead to impure acts. The mind will be strengthened by dwelling upon elevating subjects. If trained to run in the channel, interesting phrase, we now know this is neurologically accurate. If trained to run in the channel of purity and holiness, it will become healthy and vigorous. If trained to dwell upon spiritual themes, it will naturally take that turn. 
But this attraction of the thoughts to heavenly things cannot be gained without the exercise of faith in God and an earnest, humble reliance upon him for that strength and grace which will be sufficient for every emergency. We also read, all are free moral agents. And as such, they must train their thoughts to run in the right channel. The first work of those who would reform is to purify the imagination. Our meditations should be such as will elevate the mind. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good, of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Here is a wide field in which the mind can safely range. And one more, if Satan seeks to turn the mind to low and sensual things, bring it back. You see the exercise of the will there. When corrupt imaginings seek to gain possession of your mind, flee to the throne of grace. Flee like Jacob fled from the adulteress and pray for strength from heaven. There's your game plan right there. Bring it back and pray for strength. Reroute that thought. By the grace of Christ, it is possible for us to reject impure thoughts. Jesus will attract the mind, purify the, the thoughts and cleanse the heart from every secret sin. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Is it possible, brothers and sisters, to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ? Indeed it is. It's a promise that God will do this in us. Romans 6 verse 16 says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? We can be slaves of obedience leading to righteousness. We can be enslaved to pure, purity. We can be enslaved to pure thoughts in this pornographized world that we live in today. I want to be impulsively obedient. I want to get to the point where I am just carrying out my own impulse in following God's will. That's what God wants to do in every single one of us. We will be either habituated to one or the other, sin or righteousness. You see this? This is what we saw earlier. The damaged pleasure centers of the brain. Well, once you become a slave to righteousness, the kind of thinking that will change, the kind of change that will happen in your brain is actually measured here in this brain scan. Here's some hope for you. See what the, the, the methamphetamine user looks like after 14 months of being off his substance. See those pleasure centers again? You can once again find joy and peace in life. And God will take you through the steps. And stick with me on this series. You don't want to miss out on a single session. You want to be taking notes. Listen to the voice of God. Pray through this as we go. And I'll tell you, what you're going to see, this, see this, this brain on the screen? That's you. That's you. Not the one with a bunch of holes in it that you saw and you thought, what have I done to my brain? That one where you had that shock moment. Here is a shocking portrayal of hope for you. That's your brain. A renewed brain. A normal brain. After God has healed you. I want to close with a quotation, a few paragraphs from this book that I have in my hands called Faith and Works. This is a wonderful little devotional that I was reading and God spoke to me on this one in a very, very strong way. I'm going to read to you. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so was the Son of Man lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you are conscious of your sins, do not devote all your powers to mourning over them, but look and live. Jesus is our only Savior. And although millions who need to be healed will reject his offer to, offer to mercy, not one who trusts in his merits will be left to perish. While we realize our helpless condition without Christ, we must not be discouraged. We must rely upon a crucified and risen Savior. Poor, sin-sick soul, discouraged soul, look and live. Jesus has pledged his word. He will save all who come unto him. Come to Jesus and receive rest and peace. You may have the blessing even now. 
Satan suggests that you are helpless and you cannot bless yourself. It is true you are helpless, but lift up Jesus before him. I have a risen Savior. In him I trust, and he will never suffer me to be confounded. In his name I triumph. He is my righteousness and my crown of rejoicing. Let no one here feel that his case is hopeless, for it is not. You may see that you are sinful and undone, but it is just on this account that you need a Savior. If you have sins to confess, lose no time. These moments are golden. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. For Jesus has promised it. Precious Savior, his arms are open to receive us and his great heart of love is waiting to bless us. Some feel that they must be on probation and must prove to the Lord that they are reformed. Before, that they can, before they can claim his blessing. But these dear souls may claim the blessing even now. They must have his grace, the spirit of Christ, to help their infirmities, or they cannot form a Christian character. Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are, sinful, helpless, dependent. The sinner sees himself as incomplete. His repentance is insufficient. His strongest faith, but feebleness. His most, cost, most costly sacrifice as meager. And he sinks in humility at the foot of the cross. Just where we need to be, right? But a voice speaks to him. From the oracles of God's word, in amazement, he hears the message. Hear this message. He are complete in him. Now all is at rest in his soul. Imagine that you could be neurologically enslaved to purity rather than porn, enslaved to seeing the dignity of each individual rather than your, their utility to you. The process of sanctification is an addiction to holiness, a compulsive fixation on Christ, and an impulsive pattern of compassion, virtue, and love. And we will explore that in great depth as we continue. And I ask that the Lord would bless every soul with that blessing that he has promised. Our job, our work is only to look and live and receive. Is it any coincidence, first of all, that modern media was born in 1844? You know that modern media is a tool because I'll tell you something, there's a spiritual controversy with the media use issue. Your behaviors, you don't realize it, but you are being programmed. God only knows what it's doing to, to our children's brains. 2.7 times increased likelihood for depression. We saw every mental health problem skyrocketing, threefold increase in teen suicide for girls aged 12 to 14. Why isn't this on headline news every night? I mean, this is huge stuff. The average person does four times more social media than social. They do four times more anti-social media than socializing. It literally is a point now where I think we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. Children's screen time, the majority of parents have zero interaction with their children at all during those times of childhood media use. They are spending twice as much time just watching Netflix as spending quality time with their kids. I love it when researchers finally come out and just say it. They're like, it's contaminating the family environment. It's catastrophic in its effect on family life. They're losing emotional intelligence, social intelligence, facial expressions, bodily gestures. All the things that are a part of human communication are being lost on a generation. He's like, we're ripping apart the social fabric of the country. You couldn't come up with stronger language because these are the guys that invented it and they're doing their apology tour. So the love of most will grow cold in the last days. 
and now we're witnessing in the studies a measurable 40% decline in people's empathy. So the research is showing the Bible to be true and showing that we are in the last days. But what is causing this? And so you see yourself, like your social media persona is you. In this insecure generation, the gospel has the answer to this. He says you are worth more than many sparrows. Don't be beaten down by your feeling of how you're perceived on social media. What is the God-ordained, divinely designed life? 45%, almost half of teens, now admit that they're almost constantly on their devices. The majority of 11-year-olds today have never climbed a tree. Children spend twice as much time on video games alone than all outdoor activities combined. Why is it that three quarters of children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates spend outdoors? We have made for our children a virtual prison, although they're not the criminals we are if we are permitting this. You've got mail. That thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while. You're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. Weaponized media, that is what we are dealing with. Well, big tech is doing everything they can to overrule our self-regulation. Your brain on Minecraft looks like a brain on drugs. He says it's actually easier to treat a heroin addict than a true screen addict. It's the exact same methods of addiction that big tech is using, that the casinos have been using. The inventors, creators, understood this consciously and we did it anyway. Remember that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. And remember that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yeah, we call it a smartphone. It's because the phone is smart, and we don't have to be that smart to use it. He's literally not just watching a video, but take a look. Oh yeah, let's, let's scroll through Instagram and see, see what else is on there. A chimpanzee can use social media. I never thought I'd see the day. Well, not only is Google storing our facts for us, but they're going to start doing our thinking for us, and I already have, actually. And it's dumbing us down dramatically. Are we now? In the 21st century, entering upon a new dark age, the largest and most standardized and most centralized form of attention control in history. The mass mind can be shaped now in the 21st century like never before. This is something that is programming your mind You are not in control of your thoughts. When you are subjected to big tech's manipulation, they are doing what Edward Bernays only could have dreamed of. So there's so much hope when Jesus says, whom the Son sets free, he is free indeed. So we can be freed from the manipulation, freed from the addiction, and we can say, yes, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who liveth in me. Here we are in these last days, tracking and tracing Bible prophecy, understanding where we are in the scope of time. Civilizational collapse has already begun. Building back better also needs to only take place once something has been torn down. And so that's the preparatory agenda to facilitate the need for a great reset. That's what COVID, lockdowns, the chaos strategy, energy crisis, you're going to see a lot, world war, all kinds of things happening deliberately foment civil unrest, breakdown of social order, economic chaos. We've got a session called the Chaos Strategy, deprived by design. Pay insufficient attention to the frightening scenario of a comprehensive cyber attack, which would bring to a complete halt to the power supply, 
transportation, hospital services, our society as a whole. The COVID-19 crisis would be seen in this respect as a small disturbance in comparison to a major cyber attack. These top global elites just have an uncanny ability to predict what's coming next, don't they? Are we ready for a new world order? Why the new world order is impossible to implement without creating mass chaos. A, a big mess. We're going to look back on COVID in 2020-2021 as peace and prosperity. Revelation 13 speaks of a time when the beast's mark will be enforced with no buy, no sell edicts and even death decrees. And it has led many historians and Bible scholars and just social commentators to query and wonder what kind of a society allows for and facilitates that. It must happen in the context of great chaos, deprivation, dependency, need, even violence and civil unrest and war. That is essential to understand. And I'm not trying to just be doom and gloom. I want to level with people because we're talking about country living. We're talking about being prepared for the last days spiritually. The breakdown of the global economy, particularly in the West, and both of those sessions, two complete sessions on these issues, and both of them reveal very clearly that Europe as we know it today is fizzling, is crumbling, is failing economically and in terms of the civil order. If you read from Ambrose Evans Pritchard, a respected financial journalist, he writes that the EU was a CIA project. And he also refers to it as, quote, the Caesaropapism of the EU project and his technocrat priesthood. Fresh recession will cause Eurozone collapse. Also, the collapse of Europe. And I don't say that phrase lightly with some type of hyperbole. Literally, the collapse of the Eurozone, the Euro currency, the European economy. And I see the need for action. I see the need for a great reset. The blessed hope of the soon coming of Jesus Christ. A greater reset. Not a new world order, but a new world, literally. I'm telling you right now that as we head into 2023 and beyond, we're looking at the fulfillment of what was started here. An intensification of magnitudes that will be frightening to those whose hearts fail them for fear. As the signs of the times transpire, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth not.